Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fossils of New Zealand, remnants of a lost continent. As Francois has said, uh, my main background these days is uh, as a primary teacher. Uh, so unlike maybe some talks, there might be a little bit more audience participation than you're used to. I have been a paleontology nut since I was, uh, well, younger than I can remember. Uh, this would be a picture of a uh, little me. I don't know what went wrong in between there and now. Um, but this is uh, taken in the first year of the museum. Um, and again, yes, I worked at the Royal Tyrrell Museum for four summers, um, both in the education department and the Badlands Science Camp. And for those people who, who know me, yes, uh, I usually did uh, walk around in the theropod death pose. Um, I also, during this time, invented my, my puppet character, Tromador the Tyrannosaur, who still has a strong internet presence. The only reason I put him here at the beginning of the talk is for some of our pictures later on. Uh, he will be a useful um, scale bar. I, I uh, forgot to take along my ruler, so if you need a point of reference, many of the photos include Tromador. This is about how big he is compared to one of me here. Uh, and finally, uh, I did work uh, at the uh, geology department of the University of Otago as a uh, preparer. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't take a picture of myself, so I got a picture of Tromador in my place. Uh, and as you'll see shortly, um, when I say fossil preparer, this is actually a rather big deal in New Zealand. We might take it for granted here. To start off with, uh, a quick geography lesson. I'm, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but it's very important uh, to know what we're talking about. So here is the Earth. It is a nice round Earth. Um, right here is New Zealand. Ooh, not very big. Uh, however, for people who are a little more astute, you might notice there's this big blue blob. And that's going to be very important here at the very beginning of the talk, um, in particular when it ties into our lost continent. Uh, but one of the interesting things I have discovered about New Zealand is it turns out a lot of people don't know a whole lot about the geologic place that is New Zealand. Um, and I've been on a personal crusade to fix Wikipedia because people will find out a lot about things like the paleontology, but they don't bother to look up the geology. Um, in particular, I was looking at a site about New Zealand mosasaurs and quote, I forgot to put it in that slideshow, but they said, quote, there are very few remains of dinosaurs found in New Zealand, but marine re uh, remains are very common because of New Zealand's history as a volcanic archipelago. <coughs> Wrong. Uh, and I've been going through trying to fix that. It's very, very common in the vertebrate paleontology pages to see people refer to it as a uh, volcanic um, situation similar to, say, Hawaii, up the Pacific. Um, New Zealand does fit into the Pacific Rim of Fire. Um, however, it is not a hot spot like many others. So here is New Zealand a bit closer up compared to its neighbor, Australia. And these days, very tiny. New Zealand's just a tiny bit bigger than Alberta in land mass, uh, or Australia, of course, being a rather large continental country next door. But I'd like you to note this big blue blob once again. Once we get talking about it, you'll notice how it's actually just about half the size of Australia. Uh, and this is uh, something I think Kiwis should uh, try to keep in mind when they're, they're talking about how small they are compared to Australia. So here is New Zealand up nice and close. And this blue blob, again, for those of you who, of course, are adding one and one for my title, this is the first hints we have of that lost continent that once uh, was here instead of just this tiny island that is New Zealand plus a couple little islands here and there. Uh, they're left over. But from space, you can definitely see that this blue blob has something to it. This is actually uh, very much like, as you can see, all the other continental bits. This is actually a remnant of a tectonic plate. I'll talk about that in a moment. But before I do, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a history of, uh, or no, sorry, not quite, sorry. I'm just going to give you a quick geography lesson in New Zealand. Because once I get talking about New Zealand, I'm probably going to fall in the habit of referring to where I was living. So that was uh, the center of modern New Zealand paleontology. I didn't even know this when I moved there. I went to go teach. Uh, and actually more to the point to train to be a teacher, uh, the university I got into happened to have the only active vertebrate paleontology program in the country. Uh, and that's right down here. This is Dunedin, New Zealand. Um, it's uh, to give you a bit of context, if you don't know your geography of New Zealand, this particular peninsula out here, that's Christchurch. That would be the place that was hit by that rather large earthquake uh, a few months ago, unfortunately. Uh, but down here in Dunedin, they were OK. Uh, and I was based out of the University of Otago. So this very picturesque clock tower is what they use in all their promotion stuff. For once, it's the only time I can ever think of it, the nice picture on the front of the brochure actually houses the Geology Museum and uh, New Zealand's paleontology program. It's pretty much connected to this complex. It's actually part of the building you can see right there. Uh, when I say the Geology Museum, this is it right here. 
It's uh, three stands of um, glass cabinets. It could fit on the stage. It's a very, very small uh, museum. However, what is very significant about this, I don't have the picture here, but if you remember back to my intro with the preparation lab, this is the only uh, proper fossil prep uh, prepar preparation lab in New Zealand that isn't private. There's a couple of private citizens who prepare fossils. This is the only government funded one. And the entire prep lab would fit on the stage as, as well. So beginning right now, you're going to find that we here in Alberta are extremely spoiled when it comes to paleontology and fossils. So uh, at the University of Otago, I was lucky enough to work with Ewan Fordyce. He is New Zealand's only professional vertebrate paleontologist. They have many invertebrate paleontologists, but not very many vertebrate paleontologists in the sense that he is the only game in town. They do have many uh, masters and PhD students, but unfortunately there's no jobs for them once they graduate. They have to usually go to places like Australia or Argentina. Um, so, oh, this is supposed to say New Zealand paleontology. Sorry, I'm not going to cover all of paleontology. Um, a very quick, brief history of um, paleontology in New Zealand. They have actually had a lot of very big name historic figures in, in the science come through. So to start off with is this young gentleman here. Does anybody know who that is? Charles Darwin. Now, Charles Darwin didn't actually do a lot of work in New Zealand, um, but he did famously visit for nine days. Um, unfortunately, if you were to read his journal account of it, he wasn't very impressed. Um, but to, to be fair to New Zealand, he arrived right at the end of um, one of its bloodiest periods of history um, called the Gun Wars, where Europeans had been se selling weapons to the indigenous Maori, and the Maori had pretty much wiped each other out. So when he arrived, things were pretty much a demilitarized zone and pretty shabby. He was only really impressed with uh, the European ministry that he visited inland. But we move on to this fellow here. This is the only person in this slide that people may not know. Does anybody know who this is? That's OK. If we had a Kiwi in the crowd. Are there any Kiwis in the crowd, actually? Before I keep going. OK, that's fine. This is James Hector. James Hector um, in New Zealand is a legend. He was the first professional uh, biologist, uh, bioscience person in the country. Um, so in addition to naming a lot of the extant animals they have, for example, um, New Zealand's indigenous dolphin bears his name, so it's the Hector's dolphin. Uh, but Hector also collected a lot of the first fossils. He described a few of them, but he sent most of them to England, where we will know most of the people involved here, such as this gentleman here. Does anybody know who this is? Yes, Richard Owen, uh, the man who had coined the name dinosaur. Well, one of his first famous comparative anatomy cases was on this rather large set of leg bones here from New Zealand. This would turn out to be the giant flightless moa. Um, and just based on this leg, he was able to give a fairly accurate reconstruction. If I recall correctly, don't quote me on this, but I think he even predicted that it would turn out to be um, herbor or, uh, herbivore. Uh, and he was correct. The other person who received fossils from Hector uh, was this gentleman right here, who typically didn't get along with this gentleman here. Does anybody know who this is? Thomas Huxley. And Thomas Huxley has the honor of naming not only the first fossil penguin, but it was a fossil penguin from New Zealand. And as we'll see, uh, that's kind of their deal. Well, coming back to New Zealand, let's get to our lost continent. So those gentlemen that I just listed in that last slide would have had no concept um, that what they were looking at was actually the remains of a, a continent at the time, because, of course, plate tectonics hadn't been uh, Develop as, developed as a theory, but these days, of course, we know all about it. Uh, and I'm going to take you through that right now because that uh, is where New Zealand's fossil record is quite interesting. It tells us a great deal about the theory of plate tectonics, but at the same time, it actually leaves a few things to be wanted. Um, so to start off with, 83 million years ago, New Zealand was located just up here on the sides of what would be Antarctica and Australia. So of course, leading up to 83 million years ago, um, the, the southern continents had all been connected into a supercontinent, um, Gondwana, which was the southern remnant of an even bigger supercontinent, Pangaea. But throughout the Mesozoic, the time of the dinosaurs, that had been splitting up. And typically when you hear about Gondwana, people will, of course, talk about its more famous components, which are Africa, South America, Antarctica, and Australia. But to be really fair, New Zealand should be mentioned in that list. A lot of people neglect it, but it really should be because, as you can see, it was a fairly sizable chunk of land at that point. In fact, as of it split up at 83 million years ago, it has a different name. We don't refer to it as New Zealand. It is a continent known as Zealanda, and this is our lost continent. And as time went on, Zealanda wandered off to the uh, comparative east of the rest of Gondwana, but it actually stayed fairly south to start off with. It was only just in the last 20 million years or so, it started to drift north. 
Um, and as you'll see, this drifting north ties into why we even have a New Zealand at all anymore, because at one point we didn't have much of anything in this particular area, especially right here at 40 million years ago. All right, so to start off with, 83 million years ago, um, Gondwana should be here. I didn't put it in this restoration. I'm kind of a twit, should have done that. But um, here we have Zealanda at its largest. This was when it was the biggest. It was about half the size of Australia. Um, and as it split, um, Zealanda was in a very unfortunate tectonic position. So to begin with, before it was Zealanda, before it split off from Gondwana, um, during the Paleozoic, so that's the time period uh, before the dinosaurs, um, this had just been a bunch of sediment on the bottom of the ocean. Um, with the breakup of Gondwana, um, that eastern front of Gondwana started to push up on all the, the marine sediments off its eastern coastline, and it eventually pushed it up and accumulated into a very thin amount of sur um, surface tectonic plate. It made it into a very thin um, bit of, of continental rock. However, right through the middle here, which ties into that bit with Christchurch, is a tectonic boundary, which is why New Zealand is prone to have earthquakes these days. Well, back at this point in time when Guanwana was splitting up, those two um, plates were actually moving away from each other and that caused New Zealand slowly to get stretched apart and as it stretched, it was such thin continental crust um, that very much like um, Alberta did in the, the mid, or sorry, the, the late Cretaceous there, submerged. As this land spread out, it was so thin, it wound up getting submerged. And so uh, as of the KT boundary, New Zealand was still pretty pretty substantial, uh, but once you get to 55, we're starting to lose it, we're losing it. Oh boy, 25 million years is a very important date. This is the middle of the Oligocene. We're running out of New Zealand really quick. It's spread to its, its maximum um, width. But as of 20 million years ago, what happened was Australia shifted and started moving towards this plate boundary, and so land started to get pushed back up. And as of 10 million years ago, we get pretty close to what is modern New Zealand now. Um, five million years ago, we start to get the split up of the North Island from the South Island by the Cook Strait here, um, which is a very substantial landmark bio um, geographically these days. And eventually we get right here. And so right here along the South Island, you can actually see um, that boundary quite clearly through the Southern Alps, has um, off branches pretty much all throughout here. So the entire country is prone to earthquakes. And actually that fault keeps going up throughout here. Um, so here we are at what's left of New Zealand. It's about one-eighth of its former size. So unfortunately, we lost one of the great continents of the Mesozoic, but that's okay. All right, so knowing this geolo uh, geologic history of the submergence of New Zealand, what are some of the overall lessons we can learn from New Zealand? So geologically speaking, one of the biggest questions is back in the Oligocene at 25 million years ago when New Zealand submerged to its most submerged point, how much of it was left? And there's a very big debate going on between geologists and paleontologists as to whether New Zealand completely sank or some of it was left. Geologists point to the fact there are no terrestrial uh, rocks from that time period, um, and they claim that it was completely submerged. Where paleontologists, as we'll see in a little bit, have a little bit of evidence to show that not much of New Zealand was left, but there was probably a few islands that didn't quite get submerged. But it does raise some interesting questions, because what we do know about New Zealand uh, comparatively in, in the present um, is that it was the land of birds. Um, now this fellow right here, most people probably will know. Does anybody know what this giant bird here is called? Nobody? Shout it out, shout it out. Moa! The moa is, of course, one of those famous giant flightless birds that unfortunately didn't survive past its contact with humans, but that was only 1,200 years ago. Um, so this could be considered a rather successful modern bird. It just unfortunately didn't survive humans. But New Zealand had many other interesting bits. So this was the mega herbivore of the environment. This guy right here, Haste's eagle, was the mega predator. This was the largest bird of prey that we currently know of. It had a wingspan of two meters, but that doesn't actually give you an idea of how big this thing is. Its body was almost the size of an albatross. So to give you an idea, the torso of a haste eagle is about one-third my torso. These were very, very huge birds of prey. Their wingspan was short, though, because they were adapted for flying through dense foliage, which New Zealand is quite famous for. It's very dense forest. Um, and here the two of them are together, probably doing as they would have in real life with a pterosaur in the background. But here's the haste eagle and Moa not looking too happy about meeting up with this guy. 
Uh, of course, New Zealand is famous for a lot of other um, extant animals. So, of course, the kiwi bird is the national bird of New Zealand. It's a very unusual flightless bird um, that actually is so specialized it has special whisker-like feathers it has evolved for uh, burrowing for its food in the ground. Of course, New Zealand is also the home of the tuatara, which is neither lizard uh, nor any other type of reptile. It's kind of intermediary between the family that gave rise to snakes and lizards. It has no uh, living relative with which to compare it to. Uh, New Zealand is also home of the Weta, uh, which lent its name to the special effects company that Peter Jackson uses. Um, they're a very interesting cave-dwelling nocturnal insect. This is the only photo I have of one, unfortunately. They're very hard to find, uh, so you have a tromador for a sense of scale there. Uh, but these things can actually grow. This is a common cave variety. There is a species that dwells on the cave floor under rocks that gets to the size of a mouse. Uh, and another type of bird that New Zealand is not famous for, but I think it should be, are it has many indigenous parrots. Well, the key question we have is all these birds, things like the Tuatara and the Weta, which are both very clearly prehistoric, because again, Tuataras go back into the Mesozoic, but beyond New Zealand, we don't really have a record of them in the Cenozoic. Wetas have pretty much gone extinct or evolved into other things elsewhere in the world. And of course, New Zealand's birds, there's no other ecosystem on Earth where all the key mega niches are occupied by birds. So the question is, does New Zealand's modern wildlife owe this heritage to a Gondwana heritage? Because of course, it was attached to Gondwana. It separated. It was a continent. It has not, as far as we know, had direct contact with the outside uh, other continents because, of course, all the other continents have had um, biological invasions and uh, reintroductions throughout the Cenozoic through continental connections and land bridges. But as far as we can tell, New Zealand hasn't had that. So the real question is, was New Zealand a sort of Moa's Ark? <laughs> Get it, Moa's Ark? <laughs> um, not my phrase. Uh, I borrowed that. Uh, but quickly, I'm going to go through the, the fossil record and see if that answers our question of a Moa's Ark or not. I'm going to rewind very quickly to Gondwana. So this is kind of the baseline before New Zealand was Zealanda or New Zealand. Um, and this is just going to be a really quick summary. So before I jump into the whole fossil record, I've kind of glanced over invertebrates. My apologies to anybody who's a big invertebrate fan. I can tell you all about them. New Zealand has a fantastic fossil record of things like gastropods, that's snails and those sorts of things. They have clams, brachiopods, um, coral, uh, sponges, echinoderms, things like um, starfish and sea urchins, but I didn't really cover those because frankly I don't know a lot about them and they're, they're not as interesting. But they have a very good record of that. But for especially the vertebrate paleontology record, uh, we're going to find out just how spoiled we are here in Alberta. So remember, you're spoiled. OK, so starting off uh, in the Silurian, we have some of New Zealand's very few trilobites. And this is a really tiny guy. This is one of a handful of South, uh, sorry, South Island trilobites with my headphone. Um, what do you call it, uh, plug-in for scale. It's a very tiny trilobite. They peculiarly do not have a lot of things like trilobites and conodonts, things that we think of Paleozoic fossils. Conodonts, they have just increased the number of sites in the last two years. I think they've tripled it. But back, if you read any of the books, they only have about a half dozen sites with conodonts. Oil exploration has increased this a lot. Um, but they don't have a lot compared to us. Um, once we get into the Jurassic, the fossil record gets a lot better, both in marine and terrestrial. So we get lots of nice invertebrates like the shrimp. Um, we also get some of our first vertebrates. So here's our first mystery vertebrate. Does anybody out there want to take a guess as to what this is? I will give you a date. It's from the Triassic. South Island? Nobody? Oh, my. OK. Well, this is part of an unidentified ichthyosaur. And we get quite a few bits and pieces of them. These are actually two separate jaws, but uh, they're pretty good for comparison. You get an idea of what you're looking at. Uh, we also get vertebrae. And actually, James Hector, who I mentioned back in uh, the brief history, uh, supposedly sent a ichthyosaur vertebrae um, that is on par with uh, the Shoney source we have here at the Tyrol. He found this back in 1872. Um, we can't confirm this. We have no reason to doubt him. His notes were very good, but we can't confirm it because the boat he sent it on sank, unfortunately. But there is a possible record of giant ichthyosaurs in New Zealand. Uh, they also have nothosaurs. Uh, 
Um, and there is a tentative plesiosaur from the Triassic, but uh, it hasn't been uh, fully prepared or described, so I can't really talk about it beyond that. Um, we get to our first major fossil site of New Zealand. This one's world famous. This is Curio Bay. So I lived right here, and it was about a two-hour drive south. As you're about to find out, this spot here in Dunedin, not only was I on the top of that university, I'm, I was rather fortunate. I'm by 90% of the sites you're going to see here today. So Curio Bay is a site just off the ocean here. So the ocean extends, if I could get my slide over here. Um, this is a petrified forest from the Jurassic. So this was uh, a former bottom of a um, valley that had a volcano theoretically up. I think it was up here. It's either this direction or behind the camera. I, I personally can't quite recall. Um, and it has some rather spectacular forest remains. They have uh, over six genus of plants. I think they've got it narrowed down to something like 10 or 11 different species. And you get everything from these nice stumps to really long logs. So this log here, to give you an idea, is about five meters long. Uh, and that was just one of the more spectacular ones I could get in a photo. There, there was one that was about seven meters long. Lots of nice petrified wood. And we get a shot here. So this is actually the other cool thing about this. This is the first time I ever went fossil hunting by the ocean. Um, but how many people can see the forest here? See if you can count how many trees. Any guesses? Oh, all the hands go down. But how many people can see the trees? Sweet. OK, well, here, I'll help you out. There are all the trees just in the foreground. So doot, 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 and I'll go back. So all these little stump things, these are just the, the stumps, the bottoms of trees, so you get a really good idea of the layout of this particular forest. Now, unfortunately, because this forest was buried by volcanic ash, the volcano erupted, covered it with volcanic ash, terrestrial um, land animal remains are not going to be found. They would have been pulverized. However, there is some hope um, that at some point some of the layers in the, the back wall, so back here, they're hoping that some of these layers might erode and at some point expose terrestrial footprints. Um, but they have not yet been found. Uh, but Kiro Bay, if you're in New Zealand, is definitely worth a stop. It's quite awesome when you get there. They're just everywhere. And I mean, all the stumps you see back here would be trees too. All right, so we're going to jump ahead now to the Cretaceous in the Mesozoic, the beginning of Zealand at 83 million years ago. So Gondwana was pretty much in its last gasps. As of this point, with Zealand peeling off, it was pretty much just Australia and Antarctica that were left. Um, and as of that point, New Zealand, again, was about half the size of Australia. And once it left Gondwana, theoretically, all the animals that we find on it from there on in are going to be uniquely Gondwanian and or Zealanda. They're going to go on their own evolutionary path from this point forward. So what are the critters that we have to take a look at? Sorry, I'm just going to catch up with myself. So I'm going to take you to one of the first significant fossil sites of the Cretaceous. Um, people who have a, a slightly... Um, gutter-minded sense of humor, uh, get ready to giggle a little bit. Uh, I give you Shag Point. Now, just to put that in context, uh, Shag is an alternative name for a cormorant bird, uh, and they are everywhere at this particular spot. So again, here I was in Dineen, and just another hour and a half north, as opposed to south, uh, we get to Shag Point. Um, now, Shag Point is another one of these coastal exposures with these very high, um, probably about 12 meter high cliffs at points. Here's a Tromador for reference. Uh, but what we're interested in are these giant nodules, these giant concretions. Um, and they are a mudstone concretion. And inside them, you can often find vertebrate fossils. Uh, but once you've found them, the real trick is how do you get them out of there and how do you prepare them? Uh, I was brought to this site by a local teacher um, who, in addition to this, I mean, this, the scenery was spectacular. But in addition to that, there were um, all these mysterious bits on the ground, which he thought were bones. So the instant I got there, obviously this is not a fossil bone. Does anyone want to take a stab at what they are? They are actually a fossil. They are a trace fossil. Uh, do you want to guess as to what they're a trace of? There's no right or wrong answers. Absolutely, shrimp burrow. Oh, I was supposed to get a title there. But they are indeed a shrimp burrow. And they are everywhere. Um, and it actually has given the nickname to this place. It's actually Bone Beach. Uh, all the locals are under the assumption they're bones because at this exact same spot, um, we have a very diverse uh, Mesozoic ecosystem. Oh, there we go, shrimp burrows, including these large guys here, these vertebrates and, of course, these guys here. Uh, but we also get all the invertebrates, these belemites. They're quite common. And in fact, with these belemites, we have been able to uh, index fossil this site. I, 
oh, I didn't write down the precise time, my apologies, but it was in the 75 million year range. I think it was 72. I can get you that date if you're really wanting to know. Um, but this particular plesiosaur marine reptile here is New Zealand's most complete vertebrate fossil. And it was found at Shag Point. And as you can see, you can kind of see the outline of that concretion. This is a panorama, so I'm kind of standing right here. So it kind of curves in the photo. It's more straight in real life. Uh, but it's a very large animal. It's almost the length of um, this beginning bit of the, the stage in between the stairs. Um, and um, this particular animal is named Kaifekia. Uh, and I'll apologize in, in advance. My Maori is not particularly fantastic. But whenever you see a WH, that's a F. I'm not making that up. My pronunciation is not that bad. Just the guy who transcribed the language came up with some weird sound letter combinations. So Kaifekia is a cryptoclided plesiosaur. Um, but it's rather unique. Um, here's the skull. It's a rather nicely preserved skull. Has um, over 100 needle-like teeth. Clearly a squid eater. In fact, his name in Maori means eater of squid. Um, but when Dr. Fordyce did the description and the analysis, what he came to the conclusion of is Kaifekia is um, a very primitive cryptoclidid. It has much more in common with Jurassic uh, cryptoclidids from uh, Europe than it does contemporary cryptoclidids that lived around Australia and Antarctica. So when you compare him to the other cryptoclides we know of in the area, he's rather primitive and we're not sure what's going on. Um, he does have some very um, derived traits from those primitive cryptoclides. In particular, he has a very large eye orbit. And the question is whether he's diving down deep to catch cephalopods uh, or w whether this was an adaptation to deal with polar conditions, which we'll get to here in a moment. Uh, so here's Kaifekia in a reconstruction I did for Dr. Fordyce, eating a nice little belemite. Ouch. Um, but of course, uh, there were other plesiosaurs that have been found in New Zealand. So this is Mauisaurus. Um, this is one of the things I like about New Zealand critters. Is a lot of them are named after Maori mythologic figures. So Maui was uh, um, a Maori demigod, very similar to Hercules. And in legend, one of his great tasks, he did things like tame the sun. He tried to destroy death. But one of the other ones that he's famous for is he went out fishing with his brothers in a region of the ocean nobody had ever been to before. And when he went fishing, his brother were just catching fish. When he threw in his line, he pulled up a fish so big it would become an island. And he um, supposedly with this fish created the North Island of New Zealand. So he got his own plesiosaur named after him. It's actually an elasmosaur. Um, but interestingly, it's only really known from the rear, ha or sorry, from the torso. So it cuts off at about the neck. We have a couple vertebrae that have been assigned to Maui source. There's some contention on that. Uh, but as we'll see in a moment, there's, there's a question as to whether another elasmosaur from New Zealand is actually the same animal as Maui source. But we'll get to that in just one moment. Uh, and of course, the other thing we find with these plesiosaurs, we find lots of gastroliths. Um, and I won't go into the, the controversies there, but there's a lot of questions as to what plesiosaurs were doing with these gastroliths, whether they were for buoyancy or helping digestion. New Zealand hasn't exactly helped solve this problem, but we do have samples of gastroliths for people to study if they're looking for a more uh, large sample base. Uh, now, all these plesiosaurs, of course, had other things in the water they needed to worry about. One of them being these guys right here, who my favorite group of marine reptiles, the mosasaurs. Uh, however, I'm aware that I have a, um, one of the guys who uh, has started off the mosasaur renaissance. So I'm aware of the fact that my picture here is very out of date. Uh, I did this to be kind of like a, a monitor lizard with flippers, but I'll rectify that in a moment for you. But yes, at Shag Point, we have this column of neck vertebrae from a mosasaur. That's all. We don't know what kind of mosasaurs specifically were living at Shag Point. Uh, and the big problem there is those big nodules from before. So you have to have a nodule that erodes enough that you can find the bone, but hasn't eroded enough that the bone's all gone. Um, so this particular one was a boulder about the size of a basketball. Uh, that had broken open. They, I think it was this end they saw. So they prepared it. They got these neck vertebrae. The pro other problem is the locals didn't like the removal of that plesiosaur. Uh, and they have kind of requested that people don't remove fossils anymore because it caused a lot of damage. Um, but from elsewhere on the South Island, a bit further north by Christchurch, we also get my favorite of all time, Tanifosaurus. Uh, Tanifa is a Maori uh, word for basically mythological monsters. And pretty much every area had about a dozen of the, the monsters. I could tell you lots of stories. Um, they were my favorite. But I just love the fact that Mosasaur got named after them. Uh, and this particular group is turning out to be a lot more cosmopolitan um, than I had originally been aware of, um, with new species being described in Antarctica and Japan now. 
um, which raises the question. They also have, so uh, Taniphosaurus is a tylosaurine, um, but they also have a described species that's currently considered to be a species of tylosaurus. And even before I found about Taniphosaurus in other places, I was personally wondering if that tylosaurus would turn out to be Taniphosaurus. And there may be a strong case for that. Uh, but because I knew I'd have one of the people who are uh, revolutionizing our view of Mosasaurus, I threw in this bonus slide he doesn't even know about of a new restoration of Taniphosaurus. Uh, eating one of the uh, common invertebrates, ammonites, although, um, as I'm sure he'll tell you, they probably didn't eat ammonites. It was the only thing I had to throw in the picture at fast notice. Uh, we also have non tylosaur mosasaurs. We have lots of species of prognathodon. Uh, New Zealand has three described species, or sorry, two described species and possibly two new ones coming down the, the pipe. Uh, so we have this one from up by Christchurch. Um, and then we have this new species uh, discovered just outside of Otago. This particular guy is from a locality that is a marine KT boundary. Um, this is the lower jaw, uh, both sides of it. They actually have the skull. It's just currently in another one of these large concretions. So that's the other problem that New Zealand has going for it. Most of its specimens are in these giant concretions that are both hard to collect, prepare, and find in the first place. Um, but once he's fully prepared and hopefully the next decade, um, we'll have another idea of a, another new prognathodon. But what's also neat about this is this is a clear record of mosasaurs being present in Zealanda just before the extinction of the dinosaurs and the mosasaurs. Uh, and at that same site, there's no evidence of, of mosasaurs afterwards. Um, but that doesn't hold over for all of our reptiles, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, the other things we get here are, of course, those belemnites I mentioned. Um, we also get things like bivalves. Uh, I can't remember what that one there is. Um, and now we're going to jump up to the North Island. This is one of our few fossil localities we're going to talk about in North Island. Part of that's because lots of stuff is down here in the southern half of the southern island, and I actually just know it better because I lived there, of course. Um, but this particular site is famous not only in New Zealand, but to an extent it's world famous if you were... Uh, living in the, the late 70s and 80s and paying attention uh, to Southern Hemisphere paleontology. Uh, this is Tohe Valley. And the Tohe Valley was, um, is a very interesting site because this is a fossil locality. Um, dense forest. In fact, it looks like something that a dinosaur could have lived in. Uh, one thing this photograph does not give you an idea of is this dense wall of vegetation is growing on a cliff. Uh, and this entire river valley, you have to basically find a spot kind of off in the distance. You can see how this slopes down. You're going down something along the line of 30 degrees elevation, very um, bush-like, lots of moss. It's not very um, solid ground when you get on it. Lots of mosses, you'll slip. It's very hard to get to. So the fossils you're looking for are in these big boulders in the river. Now, I didn't get this photo at the exact spot we're going to be talking about in a moment. This is about 20 kilometers south of there. I, didn't, I wasn't able to access the spot because it's not well marked on a map and it's on private property anyway. Uh, and the official saying around town is don't ask because uh, he won't be allowed. But this area was worked by an amateur paleontologist, Joan Whiffen, who sadly passed away in 2009. Uh, and she is known as New Zealand's Dragon Lady. Uh, and she's a very interesting character. In the 1970s, her husband was taking an amateur geology class because they like to collect rocks and minerals, uh, but he was sick. And so she went into the class on paleontology and she got hooked. So she started to look at maps of her local area and she discovered that the Tohe Valley had been marked by one of Hector's original um, field workers as containing the bones of Saurians. So she started working in the 1970s and she came up with lots and lots of marine reptiles. So one of her first ones was this one, Tarangisaurus. Uh, that's another elasmosaur. Um, and Tarangi just means in Maori large. So this is large reptile just in, in Maori. Um, interestingly, Tarangisaurus, an elasmosaur, is only known from skull material. And there's a lot of people who are starting to question because it's of a comparable age to um, the rocks that Maui source on the South Island is found. It's a question as to whether the two are the same animal. I can't say, but hopefully future discoveries will shed some light on that. She's also discovered several mosasaurs on the North Island. This is Rikisaurus. It's a very interesting intermediary species uh, between um, some primitive mosasaurs and proper mosasaurus. Uh, and it's a, it's a cool specimen. She also has her own species of pronathodon. This is named after, I believe, a northern hemisphere species. Uh, that's what it's currently described as. It may be reclassified later on. Uh, but the other thing that she found, so this deposit in the Tohe Valley is a marine deposit. It's in a shallow estuary or lagoon. Uh, but she also found some other bones. Oh, sorry, in addition to things like this giant ammonite. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a, a reference for you. This is about six feet in diameter. It's a pretty big guy. Uh, late Cretaceous ammonite. Uh, but she also found the most prized of Saurian fossils, depending on who you ask. Um, what did she find? 
Nobody's going to guess. She found marine reptiles, and with them, she found other reptile bones that, based on the fact of differentiating them, were not marine. Dinosaurs, yay! Now, here comes the next audience participation moment. Here's where you find out just how spoiled you are. How many dinosaurs do you think they have found in New Zealand? Ooh, some good guesses. Well, we have found approximately seven types from nine bones. This is New Zealand's dinosaurs. All of them. So I was going down there and I was talking to people about dinosaurs and nobody I've talked to has found one. And actually that changed while I was there. They have now an unconfirmed dinosaur from the South Island, which is exciting. But these are all Northern Island dinosaurs, and this is pretty much all of them minus two bones. So when we take a look at them, one of these bones is kind of a cheater. So this little tiny phalange or finger bone is from a Jurassic dinosaur from on the North Island. Uh, it's probably a Slorosaurid, but that's all I can really tell you for now. So it's a Jurassic dinosaur. But every other dinosaur bone I'm about to talk about in this particular segment is from that Tohe Valley site, so it's a marine deposit. Lake Cretaceous, it is um, 75 million years ago. Uh, so these are all New Zealand dinosaurs. They're not Gondwanian. This one is Gondwanian. These guys are now removed from Gondwana for about 10 million years, so they have followed their own evolutionary trajectory. So theoretically, we could probably give them their own genuses if we had something a little more um, well recognizable. So right here is the first dinosaur bone ever found in New Zealand. It is the tailbone off of a theropod. Uh, which I have reconstructed here eating one of the other dinosaurs that we have found, some sort of hypsilophodontid like ornithopod. We're not sure if it's a hypsilophodontid or just something that resembles one. Uh, anybody who has questions about that, similar to the controversy going on with Australian hypsilophodontid like dinosaurs. I reconstructed this guy as a car, or sorry, a caracarodontid sword, but if you read books in uh, New Zealand, they'll tell you this is something like a megalosaurus or an allosaur. Um, and that's mostly because the, the key book written on New Zealand dinosaurs is by Jeffrey Cox. It's out of print. It was written in 1990 before we really understood southern hemisphere theropods. So that, the theropods we're about to talk to today are probably not remnants of a primitive allosaur or megalosaur. They're probably a caracarodontosaur or an alabinosaur. Um, but we also have bits and pieces. Here's that uh, hypsilophodontid uh, femur here. We also have a chunk of a sauropod rib. Now, this rib is very uncharacteristic, but since I took these photos about six months later, they described uh, the vertebrae from the tail of a titanosaur, so we're able to confirm, much like those theropods that our southern hemisphere sauropods carry on. Uh, this is a reconstruction by my uh, friend Peter Bond, who used to work at the museum as well, of a titanosaur. So we also have a confirmed tailbone from one of them. We don't know what type, um, but we know they're titanosaurs, which is kind of exciting. We also have bits and pieces here of um, an ankylosaur, which is kind of cool. Um, and I'm told the reason you can tell it's an ankylosaur is the way that it has this kind of shelf-like bit to hold up the armor. Uh, it has a, at moment, similarity to the Australian ankylosaur mini-me, which is what Peter Bond has reconstructed them as here. We don't have enough of any of these critters. So the majority of our dinosaurs, we only have one piece of. Uh, this ankylosaur, they're fortunate enough to have two diagnostic bits. They have that rib and a corresponding chunk of um, the hip bone. Uh, but they don't have anything enough to describe these even to uh, a specific family, that alone genus or species. Um, so again, we're very spoiled. However, these dinosaurs from New Zealand have popped up in literature. Uh, but before we get there, sorry, I forgot about this guy. Uh, we also have this little tiny piece of a pterosaur. It's a piece of a shoulder bone, um, which is kind of cool. We know there's pterosaurs there. They actually have two of these shoulder bones from um, probably the same pterosaur. They're pretty much identical, just one about this length in comparison to that one. That bone, if you're wondering, is about the length of uh, your average index or middle finger. Um, we're not exactly sure what kind of pterosaur they've reconstructed here is a similar species to one in South America. Who knows at this point? Uh, but our New Zealand dinosaurs have a connection to guys from here. Hey, who knows these specimens? So we have Edmontosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus. Um, and this was kind of neat. So in, I believe it was 2008 or early 2009, um, both uh, Phil Bell and Eric Snively from the University of Alberta put out a paper about polar dinosaur migration. Um, which mostly talked about Edmontosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus, uh, but they also mentioned New Zealand dinosaurs. And the reason that they did this was back in the Mesozoic, of course, Zealanda was one of these places where it was completely cut off. And if you actually take a look, this circle right here whoosh, cuts right through Zealanda. Most of Zealanda was polar. It was in the South Pole. 
Um, so the ongoing theory had been polar dinosaurs were migrating, at least in North America. They go up from they go up to Alaska for the summer, and then they come back down to somewhere along the lines of Alberta, where it was warmer in the winter. Um, this study was trying to disprove that. So what they came to the conclusion of was Edmontosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus, the bigger animals in Alaska, could theoretically make that journey. But the smaller things like Troodon and the Hypsilophodontids they had there couldn't make the journey. But Clearly, based on the fact we had dinosaurs from the separation down here in Zealanda, these dinosaurs were surviving just fine. I mean, any dinosaurs in Antarctica and Australia theoretically could be migrating this way, and very unlikely with the distance. But there was definitive proof with Zealanda that there were dinosaurs successfully surviving in a polar environment where they could not migrate. They were stuck. They had to, they had to stick around. So that was kind of cool. But the really cool dinosaur discoveries way off coast here, so I haven't been here, but this is um, the Chathlam Islands. And uh, in the 2000s, I believe 2002, they published the discovery of some theropod finger bones. Now this is a really interesting site. So the official publication has these as being about um, 80 million years old. So they're borderline Gondwana Zealanda. Um, but the deposit they're in is actually Cenozoic. It's from about 61 million years ago. What's interesting is they had interpreted this when they first found it. They just found the one deposit with these theropod bones, and they interpreted it as a, Cenoz or as a Mesozoic layer that had eroded. These bones had fallen out and then been reburied in the Cenozoic, so it was just a reworked layer. However, field trips, or sorry, field um, crews after this on the same island found multiple outcrops of the same formation and have found more dinosaur bones. There is some evidence to suggest it's a bone bed, meaning we might, I emphasize might, have the first post-KT dinosaur. And this kind of makes sense when you think about it because the dinosaurs in Zealanda were adapted for polar conditions. So if an asteroid smacked into the Earth, well, Zealanda, when you took, take a look back, well, South America is just on the other side of the globe here. It would have shielded Zealanda from any direct damage from that asteroid. So the only thing it would have to deal with is that post-impact radioactive winter, as it were, the cloud of dust that would have blocked out the sun. To these dinosaurs, as long as that was a fairly short-term thing, a year, couple years, maybe even five years, that would have just been a bad stretch of time. They would have been adapted to survive. So it makes sense that we might be finding some dinosaurs there. This has not yet been confirmed in the literature. Anybody who's interested, you can contact Steve Morton in Australia. He's the one in charge of this. I'm not sure if they're, they're, they're working on it or not, but give him a shout, see what he has to tell you. Uh, but that kind of brings to a conclusion the Mesozoic, the KT boundary, dinosaurs and marine reptiles fairly well. Well, that brings us to the end of the Zealanda period. So, of course, Zealanda separated from Gondwana 83 million years ago. The end of Zealanda, the continent, came uh, at about 25 million years ago uh, with that submergence. And there wasn't much of a New Zealand left. Unfortunately, we don't have much of a terrestrial fossil record. In fact, we have none. We have a fantastic fossil record from the shallow sea surrounding Zealanda. And it was home to um, some fantastic craters. But the other cool thing is the rocks. This is a, a time period where tons of limestone was deposited because that uh, shallow sea was very, very productive. So some of New Zealand's big, big tourism landmarks, these are all geologic sites I've been to, uh, owe their heritage to this, this limestone and the unique um, erosional characteristics that it has. So we're just checking the time. Oh. Can't do that. Anyways, um, so these come, or sorry, one of the most famous sites is the Mareki boulders, uh, which are just a little bit north of Dunedin here. They're about an hour north. And when you get to them, well, these are them here. To give you a sense of scale, here's a person, here's a boulder. Uh, New Zealand tourism, when they photograph it, photograph it like this, and they give you the impression these things are huge. Well, the, the biggest one's about two and a half uh, meters in diameter. But they're actually really cool. They're actually a form of fossil. Funny enough, not really a big one. The fossil's not this big. So if you take a look on the inside, what this would have originally been is a tiny little snail shell. And due to the volcanic activity just going on, um, uh, theoretically, on terrestrial New Zealand, uh, ash that mixed with the water had a chemical reaction with that uh, shell, which caused this gold calcite stuff to form, which then glued the surrounding sand. And you got these perfect spherical boulders out of the, the process. So very neat kind of fossil in a sense. Um, but if you're in the area, I definitely suggest checking them out. Just keep in mind they're not as big as the photos typically make them look.
Okay, now we get to New Zealand's one famous site for paleontology. Um, this is the Waitiki Valley. This is kind of their equivalent of Dinosaur Provincial Park. Uh, and so when you head to the area, it's nothing but pristine outcrops of limestone uh, in their equivalent of the foothills leading up to the Southern Alps. Uh, and there are some very cool things to be found here. Uh, this is probably the most famous of sites. This is one I've worked twice uh, in field work with the university. This is Earthquakes Otago. Uh, and the reason it's called Earthquakes is originally when it was found by the locals, they thought that this um, outcrop was caused by earthquakes. It's not. It's just erosional. Uh, but large sections of this hill will collapse. So um, after my photograph here, there was a section, not this specific one, but a section like this, just off the picture here, that actually was in... Um, one of the, the field trips, the first field trips photos, and then it had collapsed by the time I arrived. Um, very dangerous uh, to work at in rain. You're not allowed to go there. But uh, the things that we find, they're still scary in the water. They're not mosasaurs anymore. We get the mammal equivalent, the whales. So um, we have quite a nice cross-section of these shark-toothed dolphins, they're called. Um, and did I skip a slide? No, I did not. Cool. Um, so this one is a new squalodontid. Um, it does not have a name as of yet. It's in the process of being described. This skull is about two meters long, or not two meters, sorry, a meter and a half. So it's about four feet long, pretty big critter. This little guy here, Waptita, is, uh, the skull's about that big. He's a cute little dolphin. Would have been about the same size as something like a, a common dolphin or a Pacific white-sided dolphin. Um, but these things were probably pretty terrifying to the uh, mid-sized to smaller-sized critters that they were li living with. I like to call them the uh, orcas of the Oligocene. Um, and the reason that they're called a shark-toothed dolphin is their teeth here. So what's neat about the squalodons, or shark-toothed dolphins, is they're kind of the next step of whale evolution that you don't hear about. So when you hear the stories, of course, we all are pretty familiar with terrestrial animals going in the water, losing their rear limbs, growing tails and fins. So they grow into something like the serpentine-like uh, Bacillosaurus or Zorodon. Well, New Zealand's actually where those serpentine-type whales wane out and we start to get things like these guys. So they still have the differentiated teeth because whales today, of course, if they have teeth, have teeth that are the same throughout their entire mouth. Uh, these guys still have differentiated dentition. Um, so the front teeth are very, very spike, tusk-like things. They're basically just for impaling uh, prey. But these back teeth are very shark-like and they're what they probably would have sheared their uh, food with. Um, squalodons overall were not a very successful family long term. They would go extinct about 15 million years after they uh, show up. However, they do have an off-branch family that's still successful today. Those are river dolphins. They're very closely related. And you can kind of see that with the elongated snout uh, and the lower eye down here. Um, but New Zealand is kind of one of the big meccas of Oligocene whales. Um, and I'll talk about why that diversity pops up here in a second. But these are all whales found around Otago. Um, these are this one and this one are the actual specimen. This one, I understand, is a specimen of an American uh, bottlenose whale. However, uh, they have an equivalent New Zealand one. I just threw it in. I didn't realize it wasn't New Zealand at the time. But basically, for every one of these casts, no matter what their origin is, whether they're American or not, they, they can match it in New Zealand. Um, we also get disarticulated whales, so a lot of the time we just get skulls. Uh, and the reason why is that limestone, um, due to setups like earthquakes where it's very tall um, walls for the, the, the deposits, they don't want to go excavating too far in the hills because you can't bring down the, the overburden safely because you'll bring down half the hill. Um, so often they just grab the skull when they can because the postcranial on um, these early toothed whales is not as important as the skull. Anyways, but occasionally they're lucky and they get disarticulated remains where they get a lot of postcranial stuff. Um, but the other cool thing they get is they get some of the very first baleen whales. They actually have uh, a fossil record of the uh, transitionary toothed and baleen uh, whale. I couldn't find a, the, the specimen though, so I don't have a photo of it. Um, but a lot of these photos you're going to notice is another baleen whale. Don't have names. It's not that I'm lazy. They don't have names. They have so many of these whales coming up in the last 20 years, they haven't been able to keep up with the descriptions. Because again, Dr. Forby Fordyce is really the only game in town and his grad students. Um, so here's another baleen whale with the lower jaw down here. And this is the upper skull. Okay, so I'm going to get to these penguins in a moment. It's the reason I repeated this piece of art. But why are there so many different whales? Well, what is very interesting is Zelanda ties into the, the greater story of Gondwana breaking up. 
So as you recall, what I said is at the end of the Mesozoic, the only parts of Gondwana that are still attached were Australia and Antarctica. Well, the instant those two split up, because they were the last real land barrier in the south, southern ocean, when they split up, a giant circumglobal current popped up, um, and that's still going today. Well, this would have churned up huge amounts of nutrients and caused a whole new ecosystem to pop, pop, pop up in the Cenozoic that had never been seen before. And New Zealand's uh, whale record actually ties in with this rather well because at that exact same time, we see the diversification of these shark-toothed dolphins and baleen whales. What we think we see is the Southern Ocean is pushing whale diversity and evolution to a level that we have never seen before or since. So when we look at baleen whales today, they're all just derived from one family. Most of the baleen whales I just showed you are extinct forms. They don't have living relatives today. Only one, um, the uh, Raquels, I might be mispronouncing that, but anyways, um, all modern baleen whales derive from one surviving element. Whale diversity was way more back at this stage than it ever has been uh, before or since. Um, now, penguins is New Zealand's direct claim to fame. They have more of them than anywhere else in the world. Uh, you can take the, the next two leading countries, which I believe are South America and Antarctica, and they still don't match New Zealand's uh, penguin fossil finds. So we get them in every state as disarticulated, as you'll see from my quick field trip story, but we also get articulated complete ones. And this is an extant blue penguin beside it here. This is uh, the fossil penguin here. Um, and what's kind of neat about penguins in fossil penguins in New Zealand is they have kind of revolutionized our view of penguin um, evolution, but I'm going to get to that for the conclusion of my talk. Uh, we also have other marine animals, including this mystery animal here. Does anybody want to venture what this is? This is a slide directed at Dr. Brinkman. Does he want to take a guess? It is a turtle. It's specifically from a fossil leatherback turtle. So those were little shell fragments from a guy very similar to this. Um, so this is the point where I'm trying to cater to my, my audience, as it were. Um, we also get the large billed bird, I don't even want to pronounce that, but Pseudodontrus. Yeah. The, the, these are birds that had a bill that had serrations built into the actual beak that aren't teeth, but they, they look and function just like teeth. Um, and they, they got quite big. The ones in New Zealand were kind of mid-sized, uh, and they're not as cool as, say, the one they, I believe it was in Peru, they just found one. Uh, they also get lots of cool fish, including this moonfish. Uh, to give you an idea, this is about three meters long. You could lie down and it's still longer. You'd be about as long as these two slabs here, and it goes on for a, a third. We also get sharks of every size, shape, and description. They have lots and lots of fossil shark teeth and actually some nice complete ones with uh, things like the vertebrae and the teeth mixed in throughout here. So there's teeth and there's a vertebrae. This is from a very, very large ancestor of the great white shark. Um, he's about uh, only about a meter longer, but he weighed about four tons. It was a very massive thing, and it was probably eating those shark-toothed dolphins and other uh, whales that were rapidly evolving around it. It wasn't on the size of, say, megalodon, uh, but they do get megalodon down there. And it's actually this particular great white shark has become a real centerpiece in the argument as to whether megalodon is related to great white sharks or is its own kind of subfamily of sharks. Um, and based on just even what I saw of the teeth on this guy and the megalodon teeth we find on the southern island, I would be in the, the boat that megalodon is its own thing. They don't look quite the same. Uh, we also get some of the um, best preserved Nautilus ancestors in um, the Oligocene. Not to say that these are the first Nautilus fossils ever, but they're very, very nice for that time period. Um, and now we're going to get to um, kind of New Zealand's version of the Royal Tyrrell Museum. So this is in Duntroon, Otago. Um, this is New Zealand's only museum dedicated exclusively to the science of paleontology, the Vanished World Center. Um, and does anybody want to take a guess as to how large its gallery is? No? It's about twice the size of the stage here. Uh, it's not very big. Um, and so this showcases a lot of that Oligocene stuff I mentioned. It has a little bit here, I think in that case, a little bit about Shag Point, but for the most part, it's talking about the, the Waitiki Valley and all the, the whales and penguins and sharks and all the stuff we just took a look at. Um, so kind of jumping from this, I mean, the same way that you can step outside the museum to fossil hunt, I thought I'd take you to a, a site just uh, about half an hour away from the Vanished World Center, uh, and it's just a limestone quarry. Um, 
I'm, I'm a really bad person. I forgot to write down the name of this limestone quarry, but there are dozens of them in operation around the area. And New Zealand is actually famous for the limestone you get out of here. It's called Amaru limestone, just named after a, a city on the coast. Uh, but a lot of the old Victorian era buildings in New Zealand are made out of it, and even actually buildings as far north as I understand Florida are made out of it. Uh, they still actively mine it today. Um, and so this is us uh, working just on this upper cliff you see up here, just on the, the top of the quarry, is where we actually ended up. We did survey down at the bottom, but the only thing really worth checking out was the slag heaps. Uh, but once we got up top here, uh, we made some rather cool discoveries. Uh, one of them was by me. All right. So I thought I was doing pretty good. In Alberta, I have only ever found you know, isolated elements. Here, I found associated disarticulated penguin vertebrae and two ribs. Oh, I thought I was doing fantastic until Dr. Fordyce uh, found an articulated set of hips. And one of the girls found not only vertebrae and ribs, but two scapula included with hers. But that tells you how plentiful the penguins are. We, did, we found all these within the course of an hour. Um, what's also cool is how they get them out of the ground. So Dr. Fordyce is the only vertebrate paleontologist in New Zealand currently. He also employs, as far as we're aware, the only professional government employed technician. So between the two of them, they can't really excavate things efficiently on their own if they use the, the techniques we do. So they kind of cheat a little bit. Uh, when they do things like pedestaline and excavation. So when we found that penguin, or those penguins, we had about two hours left. Dr. Fordyce took a look at his watch and said, oh, we got about two hours. Eh, we'll get them out of the ground right now. And I was sitting there going, how are we getting things out of the ground? I expected we'd have to come back you know, a few times over the course of a few, a few weeks. But he pops into his truck, puts on his orange coveralls, and pulls out a chainsaw. Well, this is how he works. You can kind of see it here in the ground. So what he does is he cuts an initial square around our specimen. And then what he does is he kind of makes a tic-tac-toe pattern around that. That outside tic-tac-toe is your uh, pedestal and trench. So he takes out the, the squares on the outside to give you your instantaneous trench. And you have an instantaneous pedestal. Well, at this stage, if you need to put a field jacket on it, you can. However, remember that this limestone that we're working in is used to make buildings. And all the quarrymen do, this is where he got the idea, you watch quarrymen do it, the quarrymen just cut the stone out in the same format with the chainsaw and it stays put, you know, to the point where you can put it in the building as a nice brick. So they don't normally have to feel jacket, but if they do, you can put it on and then all you have to do is cut the bottom out and ta-da, you have a nice block with fossil in it. Um, so remember that was the end of Zealanda. Now we're getting into the period where New Zealand, the island, is starting to get pushed back up. So Zealanda was continuously sinking throughout its history. And then at about 25 million years ago, it hit the maximum extent of sinking. And then the tectonic plate shifted. So now New Zealand is getting pushed out of the ocean as a kind of a mountainous ch chain. What fossils do we find? Well, this is where central Otago. So this is a little bit south of where we were just looking, but kind of in the same general area. Um, I forgot to put the um, specific name of the town, but this is a funny deposit of fossils I, I found completely by accident. So I was taking my fiance's uh, father around for uh, a wine tasting throughout central Otago. It's a great vineyard area. We drove by this hill covered in shale, and I brought the car to a screeching halt. And he was very confused. Well, I had attended a talk uh, by one of the palynologists at the, uh, muse or the Otago University, and she had had a slide of at least a site that looked very identical, telling everybody this was the only fossil site you would find in this particular area of Otago. Well, I hit the brakes thinking, hey, did I just find the only fossil outcrop in the area? So I forced him to get out of the car, and they were both him and my fiance were rather grumpy because they thought I was just imagining things. I picked up a rock. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. I'll come back to that in a moment. But I picked up a rock. Ta-da. Fossil leaves. So I, I was feeling pretty good about myself that day. It was pretty awesome. Um, and their, their jaws just dropped. Um, but what this is, this is the remnants. So this is 16 to 18 million years ago. This is the remnants of a rather large uh, lake network that we know existed. In fact, it, in this picture, I have reconstructed as kind of a couple big lakes with interconnecting rivers and swamps and stuff. There's a chance that it is actually one giant continuous lake. The reason we say that is in modern day New Zealand on the North Island, if you take a look, there's a very large lake you can still, you can see on the map, uh, Lake Tapu, which is basically just a remnant of a volcano that blew up. So the giant crater is now a giant lake. 
Um, there's a chance this may have been one such lake. But in here we find really nice fossil remains of plants, um, which is very key in our study of the palynology um, of New Zealand, because it gives us, of course, the, the macro fossil to line up with the, the micro fossils that we're finding. Um, but we also find cool things like kiwis popping up, and moas. And some of our moas, now this is jumping ahead a bit, some of our moas are so nicely preserved, I should have put this towards the end of the show, but sorry, you, you get modern moa remains so that help us study the, the prehistoric ones. They even have mummified remains. This guy would have probably been chowed upon um, by a haste eagle just before the Maori showed up 1,200 years ago. So this, this particular one's probably about 5,000 years old. Anyways, um, back at our lake deposit, we find fossils of uh, New Zealand's uh, native water wren, the pukeko which is a fun name to say, they're very pretty birds. Um, but in this lake network, we get some really interesting fossils that you would not expect. So in modern day New Zealand, the reptiles you find are lizards, so you'll find geckos and skinks, but there are no snakes, and there are no, oh, so and also, sorry, you also find the tuatara, so here's a fossil tuatara, but you would not expect to find a crocodile, but yet this lake network had one. And so this is about to kick off the last part of my talk. Um, so we have a crocodile from 16 million years ago in New Zealand. There are no modern crocodiles now. The question is, is this crocodile from Gua uh, Guanduana descendant? Or did he come from somewhere else, like say maybe nearby Australia? So that's the last part of this talk, is taking that fossil record going from Zealanda, breaking off from Guanduana, taking possibly all these critters that descend directly from Guanduana, and we try to sink them and drown them, and then we push them back up. The question is, did New Zealand completely submerge, or did parts of it survive so we have direct descendants of Guanduana, a Moa's Ark, as it were? Well, to give you a bit of a background on how contentious this issue was, that same talk that I attended by that palynologist actually had a Stettler Waldorf heckler pair in it. We had two geologists who were heckling the whole time because she was contending that New Zealand had a few islands left in it. And it actually at one point erupted into a yelling match between her on stage and the people in the crowd before the university basically asked the two of them to be quiet or get out. Um, but it's, it's a pretty heated debate. The paleontological evidence, as you're going to see, it probably didn't entirely sink. But there's some compelling evidence that at the same point, despite the fact we have a bit of a Moa's Ark going, some things actually made it into New Zealand from the outside. Because, of course, here we're looking at what does this isolation as an island mean for evolution? The idea being that if we cut you off in the middle of nowhere with no contact with anywhere else, your animals should be nice, or sorry, your animals and plants should be nice and contained. They aren't going to have uh, any gene flow or competition from outside critters unless you get a, a direct connection. And we do not believe New Zealand had that. Okay, well, one of the strong bits, this palynologist had kind of branched out into a side project about freshwater fossils. And one of her key ones was the New Zealand crayfish, um, which is an extremely primitive form of crayfish. It has very, very derived and specific parasites that can only affect it. And crayfish are not the sort of thing that even if you submerged an island, desubmerged it and gave it a land bridge, these things are not going to be spreading quickly. Um, and the other one she was looking at was a form of mussel. And as we know, the only reason mussels are becoming invasive species today is people are transporting them around. They're not the kind of thing that can just uproot themselves and wander five lakes down the, down the road. Um, however, she has one problem, and that's the palynology. So when people take a look at the fossil record of plants in New Zealand, things get really, really messy. Um, so for a long time, the southern beech tree here was seen as a Gwandwanian relic and exclusive to New Zealand. However, when they did a, a study, a comparative study of palynology, yes, the pollen from these guys were showing up in New Zealand, they're also showing up in Australia, and the kicker is they were showing up in Australia, the species they were looking at were showing up anywhere between five to two million years before they were in New Zealand. And what they were finding is it would evolve in Australia and slowly but steadily make its way over to New Zealand, become established in New Zealand, go extinct, but in the meantime a new species had evolved in Australia, and then it would spread over to New Zealand as that first species was going extinct in New Zealand. There was a pattern of basically evolution here in Australia. 
it would wane in Australia, but it would pick up in Aust or New Zealand. And so we were having this extinction evolution chain going. And immediately you're going, well, how could seeds do that? Well, one of those things that happened with that southern ocean opening up is a giant wind system that constantly goes around Antarctica uh, brewed up. It's known as the Roaring Forties because it lines up with the 46th parallel, uh, southern parallel on the Earth. Uh, and what we're finding is there's evidence that plants are just scattering themselves along the southern hemisphere along this wind boundary. So the plants of New Zealand, most species that they've taken a look at, actually have an origin somewhere else. There's a few species, interestingly, though, that evolve in New Zealand, and then they get blown to places like South America um, and Indonesia. Well, one of the, the, the plants that's immediately pointed to, or plant families that's pointed to as Gondwanian, is the fern uh, family. There's uh, a couple indigenous species, of course, in New Zealand. One of the famous ones is the silver fern here. Um, and of course, it looks very prehistoric. It looks like it could be from the Mesozoic. Of course, that could totally be a Gondwanian ancestor. But what we're finding is when we actually do genetic tests on these modern fern plants, is we're finding that there's actually gene flow. They're across, um, I, uh, what do they, they don't germinate, but they're, they're spreading genetic material spores. They're actually popping every single spot I've marked on the map. Of course, this dot in Australia is supposed to mark all of Australia, and similarly, southern Africa and southern South America, et cetera. They're actually sharing genetic material through this, this current, this, this wind that constantly blows this way. And it's constantly spreading. So the plant life in New Zealand and the Southern Hemisphere in general is really mucking with people's idea of isolation on an island. It appears plants, at least in the South, are able to overcome this. They aren't endemic. They disperse. And that's all they do. Um, so Moa's arc, as far as plants is concerned, looks like for the most part it's sunk. Um, these plants are dispersing as opposed to becoming endemic. Um, however, we can kind of salvage some things. So one of the big things that I mentioned is that the genetic studies on these ferns are tying into what's called the molecular clock. So for people who aren't aware of that, what people are doing is they're taking similar animals in similar families. So for example, I'm going to talk about penguins here. So what they would be doing is they take the genetic material of a penguin, such as this yellow-eyed penguin, uh, one of New Zealand's indigenous penguins, and they would test it to other penguins and even other birds to see where the genetic variance comes in. And they've been able to... Um, through both estimates on how gene flow works and also fossils, they've been able to come up with what is known as a molecular clock. We can kind of predict where these animals diverged and you know, evolved away from each other on. Well, penguins are cool because originally they were thought to have evolved about 15 million years ago, so well after the extinction of the dinosaurs. But this penguin right here, I showed him a little bit earlier, um, actually comes from 60 million years ago, which is, oh, sorry. Should be just a little bit higher up on the thing. Oops. But um, what we think this is showing in conjunction, so right away we have a penguin pop up way before he should have, about 10 million years before it should have. But the molecular clocks, the genetic studies on modern penguins, are telling us that penguins theoretically evolved into true penguins as of 68, or I'm uh, sorry, um, 70 million years ago. So we actually, oh, sorry, this is, this is the uh, fossil here. And the molecular clock is telling us we may very well have Mesozoic penguins in New Zealand or the Southern Hemisphere in general. There's a lot of um, bird remains that have been referred to as possible Hesperornids um, from South America and Antarctica that probably, I I'm guessing, once they're properly analyzed, are going to turn out to be penguins, which is kind of neat. Um, we have other evidence for a Moa's Ark in the line of animals. So things like the Tuatara. If New Zealand completely submerged, there is nowhere else that we have any evidence or any clue of something like a Tuatara living and then getting back to New Zealand. So if you completely drown New Zealand, there's no Tuataras to replace. We can't replace, or more to the point, we can't introduce Tuataras from somewhere else. They don't live anywhere else. There is strong evidence that part of New Zealand survived. Uh, additionally, we have birds like the moa. Moas have a very long standing history in New Zealand. They go back to about... Um, 40 million years ago. We also have New Zealand reptiles such as the skinks and geckos, molecular testing and a little bit of fossil evidence, but specifically the molecular evidence tells us these guys are probably a direct Gondwanian descendant. And another neat one are the parrots that a lot of people know about. But New Zealand's parrots appear to have introduced themselves uh, about 10 million years after the KT. Um, and they have evolved into very unique forms. There, New Zealand is the home of the only flightless parrot in the world. Sadly, very endangered, but that's due to human influence, not anything else. 
However, the kiwi bird, which is often cited as one of these unique evolutionary um, offshoots, a, a very unusual flightless bird, he's very closely related to a moa, but with the molecular testing that they're doing with these molecular clocks, he's only evolved in the last 20 million years, meaning it's not a direct Gondwanian descendant. It may very well tie into that submergence thing. Maybe New Zealand was underwater. It's, it's one of these questions that probably didn't completely submerge, but it definitely mucks up the idea of a perfect Moa's arc. And last of all, back to that fossil site from the um, lake um, complex that I was talking about from 16 million years ago. This is a rogue fossil that was found that completely blows the narrative of, of New Zealand out of the water. Does anybody know what this is? It's a mammal. What is going on? Now, New Zealand, I'll just quickly note, is home of bats. They're the only native terrestrial mammals today. Of course, marine, reptile, or marine mammals, such as whales and seals and all those sorts of things. But there are no ground-dwelling mammals today. And the narrative has always been mammals were not really there. They went extinct at the KT, so birds were free to do their own thing. But yet we have a mammal pop up 16 million years ago. What's going on? A very interesting question. What were the evolutionary and biological circumstances that allowed birds to evolve into um, those megafauna uh, ecosystem slots that uh, mammals did everywhere else on the world? It's, it's a marsupial mammal. The question is whether it's directly tied to Gondwana or did it evolve, or sorry, was it introduced after that submergence but yet never took off? We don't know. Uh, so the overall story we have here is unfortunately New Zealand's fossil record is not enough to answer some of the questions that hopefully I raised in your minds here today. Uh, but there is hope yet. There is tons and tons of fossil potential deposits all throughout the country. There's just not enough people looking for them. So anybody who's looking for a fun, exotic place to go hunt for fossils, I suggest contacting Dr. Fordyce or any of the other paleontologists in New Zealand and try to work out something with them. Uh, but that brings to a conclusion uh, the remnants of a lost continent, New Zealand. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Ewan Fordyce uh, for uh, letting me tag along with him on so many expeditions and the prep lab and more to the point putting up with all my questions. My fiance Ronwin for tolerating me doing all of these things because I'd often leave her uh, all alone for a weekend. Uh, and finally to Peter Bond for uh, letting me throw the test version of this talk together. But beyond that, I am finished. Thank you very much to Francois, uh, the Royal Tyrol Museum and the Cooperating Society, and of course to all of you for braving the weather to come see me talk. Uh, that is the end.